hi everybody my name's Roz I uh, live in the UK and I have two Hungarian Vizslers Phoebe and Myrtle uh, Phoebe was my first ever dog um, we had dogs in the family of course but she was the first dog of my own that I had to wait many many years for um, to have a lifestyle where I felt it was fair to have a dog and I had dreamed of having a Hungarian Vizsla for about 15 years probably just admired the breed from afar but didn't really know much about them but knew that whatever the issues were I was having one <laughs> um, so eventually in 2013 I got Phoebe um, and to say I'm devoted to her is probably an understatement um, my kids are always ribbing me and saying, oh, we know you love the dogs more than you love us. <laughs> <laughs> and you're saying, yeah. so, and I go, yeah. have a point. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, she, I basically, you know, prioritize her. I, when she was my only dog, I prioritized everything about my life around her. I felt that everything I was doing was what I should be doing to be the most you know, fantastic dog mum. When she was about, I think she was about 14 months, we started to have some issues with her being reactive to other dogs, but it coincided when, with when she came into season for the first time. And also she had an accident, which meant I had to lead walk her for about 10 weeks. So I thought it was all just, you know, part of that series of, events not having exposure to dogs and being hormonal so we didn't think much of it um and it kind of just gradually got worse and worse until the point where she was basically reacting to dogs on every single walk that we were going on and i was um running behind bushes every time i would see somebody else i went through a lot of the sort of classical training as to how to deal with it in terms of trying to change the uh, emotional response to dogs. Um, so treating her when she looked at the dog and then she looked at me. Um, and I, it did sort of, it did help us as in we got to the point where she could be walking ahead of me and she'd see a dog coming and she would look at me and she'd come in for her treat and we could go past. Um, but it never really helped with interactions that were much closer than that. So when you had an unplanned interaction where a dog literally just came rushing into your space, she just still wasn't able to deal with those kind of situations. So whilst we had success in some regard, I remained quite dis um, uncomfortable about the whole scenario of meeting other dogs. Um, I also did quite a lot of gun dog work with, with Phoebe. Um, she's a hump point retrieve dog. So, um, because I started it quite late with her, there were some elements of trying to do the gun dog work with her that didn't turn out brilliantly because A, because I was ex inexperienced and had let her have bad habits, but also um, because she wasn't necessarily bred from the right lines. So I decided to get another dog. <laughs> Quite why well, I thought that was a good idea at the time, I can't imagine. <laughs> but so, and obviously I had a very fixed view as to what I wanted this second dog to be. Um, and along came Myrtle. So this was when Phoebe was three. I got Myrtle. And Myrtle was completely not what I was expecting at all. <laughs> So I wanted this dog that was full of confidence, that wanted to engage with me, that wanted to work with me, that was going to be this amazing gun dog that I could take out and do the sport with. But what she actually was, was a, a really quite nervous dog. She was very fearful from the very moment she came home. She was afraid of basically everything. So it took her a long time to get used to the family. Anytime I tried to introduce her to any dogs or puppies, she was afraid. She was also afraid of Phoebe to some degree. Um, and just everything was a challenge with her really. And I found it very difficult to get a good bond with her. 
Um, so that obviously didn't help. Um, and because I was already feeling a bit anxious anyway when I was out and about because of Phoebe's behaviour, then adding a second fearful dog into the equation essentially um, threw us into quite a bad place. Well, that, that was kind of a hot mess, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what so are we supposed it, to do? I, I don't know. You. <laughs> yeah. So, so it kind of got to the point where the kind of things that were happening just made me feel so stressed and it was just not enjoyable to take the dogs out. And obviously the whole point of having a dog is to enjoy them and to feel that that or a feeling of dread every time I wanted to go out and walk them was awful. So I decided about a year and a half before I found BPA to only walk in places where the chances of me meeting anything that might trigger either one of the girls was minimal so um so that's what we did but i wasn't really sure that i was doing the right thing a lot of people would still say to me well you're never going to sort them out if you're hiding away you know you've got to get out there and expose them to the things and they'll get used to it um and all, despite the fact that i was in an in areas where there wasn't a high likelihood of people coming along, I was still <clears throat> I was still worrying that there was going to be something coming because you can never guarantee, of course, that um, you're not going to see someone. So I'd become very detective-like, and I'd be if I'd see a footprint on the floor, I'd be like, "Oh God, somebody's been down this road," and then I'd be like scanning the environment to. See if I could find them. Is that a fresh? How old is this footprint? Yeah, and <laughs> is it, it was an hour old, or is it and I became fresh? really expert at dodging people. You know, I'd kind of um, I'd spy someone from about two hundred and fifty meters off, and I would need to sort of track where they were going, and I'd check which direction they were going and where they're going to coincide with where we were going. And I would literally hide behind bushes and wait for people to pass, and I'd have to be a long way away in case they might smell us <laughs> you know everything was just very it was very difficult and then we we also had issues inside the house a little bit as well because the girls were difficult with visitors because Phoebe had um, chased a jogger once when we were out and had bitten him and that made me quite nervous of her behavior around people so then it became difficult in the house as well because I was quite tense about people coming into the house and Myrtle was also displaying quite a bit of growling behavior towards Phoebe so all in all it was uh I'd say my cortisol levels were pretty high <laughs> I guess and, uh, so yeah and the because same we know that girls, that was influencing really. the girls right yeah Wow. Yeah. So you, so on one hand, you were sort of kind of managing things as best you could, but on the other hand, you were kind of living in a state of anxiety, uh, an undercurrent, it sounds like, like there was like just an undercurrent. Um, even when you went, like you, you have, you had good instincts to go to safe, calm and happy places. Um, but you weren't, still weren't able to feel safe, calm and happy, right? No, not really. I mean, obviously we had, we did enjoy ourselves and we tried yeah. to focus on our gun dog work and not worry about the fact that they were reactive and that that doesn't define our lives. Right. Um, but it was, yeah, because of the way I felt, I certainly wasn't being a good role model um, and because I now looking back on it I can now see why Myrtle behaved the way that she did because she's just that type of personality she's very impressionable she always wants to know exactly where I am she looks to me for support all of the time and if I'm this dithering mm. hot mess she was like no one can help me <laughs> <laughs> there must be a lot something to be worried about yeah so in the minute I clip her on a lead she'd be looking around just a while mum put me on the lead and her little tail would go under and you know it was it was difficult and I would be in a right flap if I didn't have treats 
if I happened to leave the house and I'd forgotten my treats, that would just be a literal disaster. And then I'd really have to hide behind bushes because if I met someone, then no way would I be able to cope. Wow. So if I remember right, you, you had, I mean, so it was like, yeah, we could call out the things that were difficult, but overall you were, you were having some good experiences with your girls and doing, you know, some enjoyable things. And, and so you were just in a place of, well, this is how it is and I'm managing and okay. Right. Yeah. I kind of, I think I decided that, you know, I've been through enough training courses I'd, and I'd been to lectures and seminars, tried to understand reactivity. I joined various different schemes, you know, play games, what have you. And whilst yeah, I would get a certain way with it, it never really helped me with how I was feeling about it all. So I just kind of resigned myself to the fact, well, this is just the way they are. And I've got to try and make the best of it. Yeah. So then what happened? What, how did you get, um, how did you get to BPA? Was it through a, a free workshop? Yeah. So the free workshop just came up on my feed one day. Mm -hmm. um, I had absolutely zero intention of joining <laughs> um, because I kind of felt, well, why would that work when everything else has worked, has not worked? I've spent, <clears throat> I felt that I'd spent a lot of money and, tried my absolute hardest to try and solve the issues that we had and yet we still had the issues um so I kind of thought well I really don't want to spend more money on it but I thought well I've got nothing to lose to listen to the free workshop so I listened to the free workshop and I kind of got a bit hooked I was like god that sounds quite interesting and so definitely because you talked a lot about safe, calm and happy and about the importance of not putting yourself in those situations that make you uncomfortable. That was one quite big element that really resonated with me. And I just thought, gosh, maybe this lady's got something that I need to find a bit more out about. Um, and I had some reservations as well because when listening to the workshop, it wasn't clear to me whether or not it would be okay <clears throat> to continue doing the gun dog training, which was you know, one of the small elements where we did have a lot of pleasure. And it wasn't clear to me that I could continue with that as well as trying to have a partnership lifestyle. Um, and I wasn't really willing to drop the gun dog training in order to get the partnership lifestyle. Actually, and even when I think about it now, I probably would drop the gun dog training having seen what I can get from a partnership lifestyle but when I didn't really understand what it was I wasn't willing to do it but when it was clarified that I could still continue with that whilst developing that lifestyle then I was um yeah I think I was one of the very first pe people to enroll after the BPA was opened <laughs> <laughs> so you had you had a change of heart yeah um, yeah so a lot has changed. <laughs> yeah. A lot has yeah. changed for you and the girls. Um, and by the way, one of the, one of the, um, one of the side benefits of having Roz in, in, in our BPA families, we get to see all her lovely photos. <laughs> <laughs> you posted the best photos. Um, yeah. So why don't you bring us forward and tell us how things are now, and then we'll go back and pull out some of the pieces that you think, you know, were a factor for you and the girls and, and to help make, make things better. Yeah. So life is completely different now. Um, as a unit, we are all completely relaxed now. All of our confidence has really grown. Um, reactivity is a rarity. We never get chasing of anything, really. I mean, the occasional, you know, if a rabbit pops out, <laughs> then occasionally they chase a rabbit. But we don't get any of the issues that we have with chasing joggers, chasing people, chasing deer, killing wildlife. Um, Myrtle's really blossomed. Her relationship with me is completely different to how it was before. Um, I really understand her now. And I am not trying to fix her. Um, 
you know we can do all the things that a normal person does now you know we can open the door to go out for a walk there can be somebody on the driveway all hell doesn't break loose anymore there does the girls just sit there and we get into the car that person doesn't have to be out of sight before we can go out I can open the boot of the car when we arrive at the walk and we calmly get out and off we go regardless of who's around and the same when we return whereas before I used to literally sit in the car and like look about and think oh could you hurry up and go because I want to get out <laughs> so I don't worry about those sorts of things anymore we can also go to places where lots of other people walk and they've got their dogs off lead and I can walk my dogs there and we've really learned to stay in a little bubble I suppose in that whilst we're aware of what's going on around us we have learnt not to allow that to interfere with the connection that we have with each other. Um, that's quite a big thing because in all the other training that I'd done, I'd kind of been told, well, if you watch the other dog, if they're giving eye contact, that that might mean that they're coming over. So I was always really focused on the, uh, on the actual trigger. And as soon as I started not to focus on the trigger, things started to improve. And it was just a step-by-step -step process, really, to be able to not focus on the trigger, then to actually not focus on the trigger and maintain connection. And then, you know, to go from walking in places where there aren't any triggers to places where there are triggers and maybe though that's a dog's on lead. And then to be able to walk in places where actually all the dogs that you're encountering are loose. So massive, massive changes. Um, one of the big issues that I had with my oldest dog was deer chasing and she did kill a deer. And after that, we had obviously a lot more issues with it because she had realized the exhilaration <laughs> that comes from chasing a deer. And catching it. <laughs> and catching it and killing it. Yeah. Um, and now she can, we find deer a lot where we live. Um, now she'll see a deer It'll run off, it'll be in plain view, and she'll just watch it. And then off we go. That's amazing. You know, she's just, it's, I don't have to worry at all about deer now, which opens up so many new avenues to us in our gun dog work, because I can now hunt them in areas where game birds might be without having to worry that they're going to take off after a deer, because they tend to be in the same places. Right. So... Yeah, amazing, really. <laughs> it is, it is. And so and you're in internally sounds like you don't you're not carrying around that anxiety and worry that you used to and you're able to really enjoy your outings. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and I think I can say the same as what a lot of other people who've said that have said who've been interviewed in the um really thinking about what does safe, calm and happy mean? And thinking about the fact that it's not just the dogs, it's me that's got to feel that as well. Mm -hmm. um, so whilst I thought I was doing safe, calm and happy, it was still possible to make quite a lot of adjustments to what I was doing. And the support that you get from the people in the group and the ideas that you get given when you think you haven't got any options is amazing. And they're, you know, they're really quite simple things that, seem so obvious when you look back on them yes but like we really slowed down the pace of our walks for instance and I didn't I stopped having a mission of I need to do this particular loop and I'm going to do it within an hour and a half to having no agenda at all for a walk and just really enjoying the fact that we were out together watching the dogs learning to observe them and be present, not allowing my thoughts to be miles away and so to not really being there with my dogs even though I was there physically. Um, so just really trying to change a lot of habits. Um, and also again, the arousal protocol, that was something that I too was really resistant to. <laughs> I think when you have a breed like a Hungarian visual where everyone says to you, oh, they're really high energy, they need to run for hours and hours a day, and you need, then you'll need to stimulate them hugely when they come home, you need to play brain games, blah, 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 blah. 
So I'd spent many years doing all of that because I wanted to be this amazing mum to my dogs. But actually, all I was really doing was winding them up all the time. Um, and I felt that the only way I could engage with my dogs was by going out with them and doing stuff with them. So we didn't really know how to just be together. Um, so it took me about six months after I joined the BPA, BPA to actually accept that, yes, the arousal protocol does apply to me, despite the fact that I have Hungarian fish lists. <laughs> I kept thinking well oh you know oh but those times they don't apply to me because there's no way I could only do 25 minutes with my dogs right. so I always had an, a, you know a yeah but for that but as soon as I accepted it and I had to be pushed actually I don't know if you remember me posting Phoebe had a an electric shock on a walk that we were out on a um, some fencing that was for cattle and that actually led to her being really quite anxious out on walks and she stopped enjoying her walks. And so that was enough to push me to actually accept that, look, here's a situation where she's not going to benefit from going out on a walk. You're going to have to find something else to do. If, if I remember right, you still needed some convincing about that. Yeah, though, yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. Very long posts of, oh my God, I can't cope. How am I going to, you know? <laughs> <laughs> people are so amazing and like when you just kind of sit back and absorb everything that people have suggested to you it's just brilliant and everything that they said is so correct but it takes time to accept that that's the truth um and since dropping a second walk for them so they always used to have two walks a day my dogs and it often for an hour and a half each so they'd often have three hours of running about a day um so since September, so for six months now, well, I've only been doing one walk a day. And it hasn't made any difference in, in terms of the worries that I had about it. So they aren't any more hyper in the house than they were before. They don't campaign all the time to go out and do things. And actually it was me really that struggled with dropping it because it was a habit that I had and I felt... I felt at a bit of a loss for a while because I was kind of like, oh, well, what shall I do now? Because I've normally I'd go out for a walk now and I don't really know what to do. And I, you know, and I felt the need to be doing something because that's just what I had trained myself to do, really. Mm -hmm. But now that I don't do it, it's just so much nicer because I've got time, you know, to just sit in the garden with the girls and to groom them. We've got time to be patient with their nail cutting and just to, you know, I involve them in things that I do around the house. So they help me fill up the bird feeders. They help me carry the washing here, there and everywhere. And it's just much, it's just much nicer. And I actually feel under so much less pressure because now the one walk that we do have is just so special and it can occur at any time in the day. There's no pressure to, fit it in because oh well I've got to fit a second walk in as well so if I don't go soon for this one then I won't be able to do the second one so just the way it made me feel as well and I hadn't really recognized that I would benefit from that I thought it was all about the dogs but mm. actually I've probably benefited much more than they have mm. I love that I love that yeah so it was you uh, I can if I if I if my memory serves me it was even um you know, fairly recently um, that you were still, you still had a, some pieces of like, like uh, it, this is kind of woo. It's like a little bit too woo for me. <laughs> I, I remember it was at you. <laughs> yeah. So when I joined the BPA, I was really suspicious. I was just, suspicious and I was like oh god what is all this and like the Facebook <laughs> group was so different to anything that I'd been used to because obviously I'm sure most of us are used to every other Facebook group where there's a lot of unkind stuff said in the other Facebook groups and people judging each other and saying oh you shouldn't do this shouldn't do that um, do this instead and none of that happened in the BPA Facebook group and I was like oh, these people, like, they, they're always saying all these wonderful things. And I'm like, it's just weird. 
<laughs> why is everyone being so nice? Why is everyone so nice? Weird. I'm just not used to it. So I kind of thought, right, I'm just going to keep a low profile because I don't know whether this is going to work for me or not. So I'm just going to answer a question here and there. I'm going to look at the posts and kind of sit there in wonderment and think, mm, not sure if this is for me. <laughs> But, and then you know fast forward to now I'm often one of the people who've posted the most <laughs> delightfully so <laughs> we always love your posts <laughs> yeah so, so yeah. It's, it's actually not very woo at all is it no and you can take whatever you want from it so yeah, yeah. you know there are lots of people who for instance, really like to get into that whole concept of the heart connection and that's something that I kind of thought to myself, well, what the hell is a heart connection <laughs> to start with? And I was like, and, oh, God, there are these people that mention about these visions that they get and they see the light and there's a string. <laughs> and I'm thinking, oh, my God, I'm just so not on the same wavelength as these people. <laughs> so I kind of... I don't think we actually had a post like that. But, I just, <laughs> but you know how you kind of build it up into something, I think, really... <laughs> So, so so I just stood clear of that bit. I just thought there's plenty of material here that I'm just going to focus on for the moment. And if I feel further down the line that a heart connection is something that I could do, then that's great. But like even now, whilst I would never really call it a heart connection, I definitely follow the philosophy of it. So it's just a, it's probably just a terminology thing that to me, the word heart connection is quite woo, but all it really means is putting yourself in your dog's paws. And I can, I definitely do that all of the time because that's what you're taught to do as part of BPA. But yeah, I, it did make me feel a little bit, ooh, am I in a cult? <laughs> 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 I love it. Yeah, it's kind of funny, but I but it's I think it's worth you know mentioning because someone else may be having similar thoughts. Like yeah, yeah. So it so just you know that the genuine, um, I mean the culture that we have, and and like for me the way I look at it is um, we're all role modeling. You know what I mean, yeah. and and so we can't and this is always one of the things that like i mean okay i'm i'm like i'm a positive dog trainer right but one of the whoops hold on a second i, I muted Roz. i muted you instead of the person hold on let me unmute you <laughs> <laughs> um um you know that we can't we can't role model for our dogs um kindness and respect and honoring and appreciation and listening if we don't do that for each other and if you know what I mean and so it kind of all trickles down you know so for me that's the culture you know and that that's important and I think that's one of the reasons that it it is so effective with our dogs is because where we the humans learn how to be that way and yes it's primarily you know we're focused on our dogs but it's because we can't lie to our dogs <laughs> we can't fake it with our dogs we literally learn how to be a good listener and to pay attention and to be present you know what i mean does that make sense yeah and so, so that's, I think that's why the culture in the group is like that because we're all kind of like practicing that and that's how it, it filters to our dog, up to our dogs. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think I had, prior to joining BPA, I had never done any form of coaching of any sort and I didn't actually really know that what you were offering was coaching so although you might have used the term coaching that didn't really mean anything to me when I joined and obviously I liked what I heard in the workshop so I joined but I didn't join because it was coaching but now that I have been in the academy and I've had you know listened to your coaching for all these months 
I kind of think, gosh, it, you know, it's really quite different to training. And, it, and as other people have already said, it, it just equips you with the ability to be able to be a different person and not to need equipment. Because that's what I always found hard about training in that I, was, I always felt like I needed a crutch. So be that a ball or treats or I don't know what, but what I really like about the BPA and the coaching is that all I need is myself and my dog. And I don't have to think that hard about how am I going to react in this particular situation because it becomes a habit. So it's not like, oh gosh, so which of those 75 games I was taught should I apply in this particular situation? And that in itself made me quite uncomfortable in training because when you're in a bit of a panic, you can't bring to your mind the right game to put into place in the right situation. Whereas if you can create new habits, that ultimately is something that you can just do subconsciously. And if you work hard enough at it for long enough, you don't have to think at all about it, like driving a car. So that's why it works, I think. I agree. Yeah. So if anyone has any questions for Roz, just type them in the chat and we'll get to them. And in the meantime, Roz, um, I mean, I, you may have said it all. I don't know. But is there <laughs> anything else you'd like to add um, uh, to anyone that's, you know, sitting on the fence or not sure or, you know, um, you know, wondering if they should settle for life. It's okay. And shouldn't I just settle for this? Shouldn't I just resign myself? I mean, anything else you want to add in closing that might give someone some hope and inspiration and um, maybe, I don't know, maybe a nudge <laughs> I don't know, yeah. if, you think, if you think it's appropriate. Yeah. I mean, I think you've really got nothing to lose because if you are like me and you're feeling a bit suspicious, you're not really sure, is it really going to help you? And you've already invested a lot of time and money in other things. You actually don't have to stay with the program if it doesn't gel with you. Um, but if you're willing to make a commitment, if you're willing to follow the program step by step, the support really is there. And I think the size of BPA, so the size, the number of members within BPA is, is really good because it's not so large that you kind of get lost in a sea of questions. So it's actually relatively easy to get that hot seat on the coaching call when you need it. Um, but on the other hand, the group's big enough that when you want support in the Facebook group, there's always, always somebody around. There are lots of people who've got lots of suggestions that they can give to you <clears throat> so you feel really supported and unlike any other training or behavioral consult that I've ever had you do get like a step-by-step -step process so although it's not mapped out you know like in a protocol for you all the tools are there for you to put them into a path that's appropriate for you to follow and you're reminded about you need to take small steps. You need to make sure you're not leaking trust, that you're building confidence in what you're doing and just to gradually push that comfort zone out. And it's, you know, you've really got nothing to lose. So <laughs> give it a go. And I'm sure you'll be here for a long time. <laughs>